Hey there, uh, welcome to Getting Started with Flink for Small Teams with RabbitMQ and Kubernetes. <laughs> the titles seem much more reasonable on paper. I'm Austin Colley Edwards, the Director of Data Platform at Fintech Studios. Uh, and at Fintech Studios, we work with large near real time data sets, mostly focused around financial news and various taxonomies. We've been a user of Flink in production for around a year now, though we started unsuccessfully uh, experimenting it with it uh, right around the time that I joined. Uh, we've run RabbitMQ in production for around four years uh, and use it in all of our Flink streaming jobs to date. Uh, in this talk, we'll really be a high level going through some of the reasons that we've ended up where we have uh, running Flink and Kubernetes. Uh, and we'll play through a loose scenario of how a need for Flink can arise and some ways to integrate it in as a small company without uh, burning out. So this is all based on my experiences and opinions, uh, which are not necessarily uh, applicable to everyone or even correct. Uh, so bear with me and uh, I hope this will be fun. So let's imagine our small company. Uh, we sell some nice dashboards that surface aggregated financial information uh, from a variety of sources on the fly. Our tech stack is very simple. It's just a API and a web app. And this is, this is really cool and all. Um, initial users are getting some value from our curated aggregations, but how is this different than many other financial portfolio apps? So we want to power more analytics in these dashboards with more personally relevant data, but we don't necessarily want to pay for the more uh, personally relevant data, especially those uh, high quality pricey stuff. So as we look into alternatives, uh, hey, Twitter is uh, almost free. Um, they've got personal information that people even trade off. So what if we integrate a curated Twitter feed analytic into our aggregations uh, to make our dashboards just a little bit more personal? So to try and incorporate hourly statistics of a Twitter feed via ad hoc API queries, let's do that in the same way of uh, integrating it with our other data sources like we have before. Uh, so this works well for some small sample feeds and the business loves the value that it brings to our dashboards. But as soon as we put it into production, we find that the load times make the data nearly unusable for users. We now know that we need to pre-compute these analytics if we really want them to be meaningful and usable. So the simplest solution that we can think of that fits in with our tech stack uh, is some Lambda functions that run on an hourly cron schedule, putting these computed analytics into a managed Elasticsearch cluster. We're still running these same slow API queries against the Twitter API, just not in an ad hoc fashion. And this solution is okay, but we find that the Lambda functions have a few drawbacks, like being generally expensive for long running computations, um, not, a, not being able to easily compare results to previous one, i.e. holding state. Uh, we also find that they're a bit difficult to observe and data uh, consistency is a little difficult to maintain when things fail, which they always do. Um, and adding to that, as we want to experiment and play around with different analytics, uh, it's hard to chain these functions together uh, and derive higher order results. So what if we built up these analytics over time as they're happening? We'd be able to eliminate these slow ad hoc queries and all the issues that they bring along with Lambda functions um, and get a little bit more flexibility. And if you haven't guessed where I'm going with this by now, da da da, stateful stream processing to the rescue. So enter Flink uh, with data sources out of the box for many, many systems, uh, including Twitter. There's a, in a, there's a Twitter integration that makes it easy to start streaming um, filtered feeds with really um, no custom connection code. So we know in this example, we want to replace those Lambda functions, but um, for sake of convenience, uh, we like how fast Elasticsearch surfaced these analytics. So let's keep that bit in our example. Uh, the Flink Elasticsearch syncs make it easy to bulk index streaming data as well. So creating this uh, Flink job to stream from Twitter, do some analytics, and output that to Elasticsearch is very, fairly easy to build, reason about, and run locally. That job might look a little bit like this, where we stream from Twitter, um, extract some users and hashtags, bucket them into hourly chunks, and compute analytics on those chunks, and then just push that right into Elasticsearch. So this solves our uh, problem with the Lambda functions and these slow ad hoc queries. It's very flexible um, and makes our dashboards be able to uh, surface consistent, relevant data. But how do we put this into production? <laughs> uh, so there's a blossoming number of ways to deploy Flink, 
Uh, and for small teams, as little work here as possible allows us to devote more time to delivering customer value, which is really important, um, especially when you have um, deadlines to meet. So if you're on AWS, you have uh, three main options. You've got EMR, uh, Kinesis, or Kubernetes through EKS. Um, and they can all be great, but they have different implications on uh, depending on who you are. So at FinTech Studios, we uh, initially tried EMR, but since none of us were Hadoop experts, we found it quite difficult to update, debug, and even do things like view consolidated logs. We were doing a ton of SSH into EC2 instances for this, and it got a little hectic, and it clearly wasn't going to work on a production scale. So managed services are intriguing, especially in these uh, early growth stages when maybe you have more cloud credits than uh, you know what to do with. Um, and for this reason, Kinesis was really appealing, um, though the drawbacks that we see or we've seen um, in regards to pricing and support for newer versions of Flink uh, were enough to encourage us to explore different options. We also found that it was a bit difficult to customize Flink jobs on Kinesis as we started getting more into tuning and configuring some of the lower level options uh, that Flink um, provides. And something that I've personally really loved about Flink and working with Flink is getting help from the community, um, like the mailing lists that are very active. Um, and one of the things that I've found is that knowing exactly how my jobs are run uh, helps me get better help from the community. So if you haven't heard the almost constant pounding of Kubernetes at your door by now, uh, you're simultaneously blessed and missing out. <laughs> so we found that deploying Flink on top of Kubernetes allows us to easily reason about costs, um, upgrade both our jobs and the underlying infrastructure, and see exactly what's going on in these clusters. And adding to that, Flink has out-of-the-box support for deploying to Kubernetes, and the support is only getting better and better with uh, newer releases as they get more native. So we found that um, managed services for Kubernetes like EKS also made it possible for just one or two people um, to manage the cluster uh, without devoting their entire bandwidth to it, which is important when you don't have a lot of bandwidth to go around um, in those early, early stages. So one thing I will say is that uh, adoption has been admittedly a little tough for us. Uh, the learning curve with Kubernetes has been a bit steep, um, but we found that similar upfront costs come with the other options mentioned. Uh, and we've been overall very, very happy with our choice in Kubernetes. So like I mentioned before, there are a bunch of different ways to deploy Flink on Kubernetes. But one of the things that I've found that I really like about Kubernetes is the amazing tooling and that uh, deployments are really just YAML files. Uh, you can write those, um, re read them, and test them on your machine um, locally in, in a way that really makes sense once you uh, have a few, uh, have a concept of the APIs out there and get a feel from what they look like. Um, but besides the native Flink tools and the other um, Kubernetes ways to do things um, and deploying Flink to Kubernetes, um, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention the Ververica platform, which we use to run Flink on Kubernetes. Uh, it's got an excellent GUI um, that makes it easy to get accustomed to Flink when you're start first getting started. Uh, it's got great auto-scaling recently released, um, and it offers a very uh, generous feature set for free in the community edition. But back to our imaginary company. Uh, we picked one of these options. Um, we've deployed our job successfully to Kubernetes, and our app is now delivering great, relevant Twitter data that makes the business hopes folks very happy and the users as well. Everyone still has a job. Nice. But wait, <laughs> what about alerts? <laughs> so now the business needs more. Uh, the users love the new additions to our dashboards, but the information is on demand, not when they need it. They have to go to these pages to find the, find the data. Uh, and getting users is hard, you know, uh, keeping them engaged is even harder. Uh, so without tracking every aspect of their lives and growth hacking their consciousness, how can we deliver meaningful insights when they want them? Well, we can do this in Flink. Uh, it's the ideal tool for the job as it offers complex event processing and other stateful operations that allow us to apply things like anomaly detection and other fine-grained rules for producing timely alerts. So we have a couple of options for going about this in Flink. And perhaps at this stage, the most convenient um, and natural one would just be building this functionality into our current Flink job, uh, because that would allow us to monitor, deploy, and do exactly what as we're doing today. So let's explore that option of building uh, alerting into our current analytics app.
so to start off, we've got this analytics app. Uh, then we'll add a couple new operators for anomaly detection, some for static rules, and then syncing these generally generated alerts into another Elasticsearch uh, index, where potentially it's pulled by our web app for some rudimentary alert. Um, and this works pretty well. You know, users start to engage with the alerts. Um, everybody's happy. Um, you can get by with this for a while. But hey, can we allow users to specify their own rules? Well, let's build that in. And what about letting them sign up for getting these alerts by email and text? Well, maybe it looks something like this. Um, and as we build more and more into this monolithic job, uh, we see it growing in complexity, <laughs> pretty astoundingly. Even while making these slides, it was uh, difficult for, to keep my wires from crossing. <laughs> Um, so similar, similarly to the issues that arise with other types of monolithic apps, uh, our Flink jobs deployments are now tied, so it's impossible to update the alerting code without also redeploying the analytics code. Uh, in Flink streaming jobs, uh, errors in one operator restart the whole topology. So if there are bugs in the alerting bits, they can also have an effect on the analytics, uh, potentially delaying or taking down the job. Scaling these jobs is also tied now, so we end up spending more money on resources because we have to provision for the highest needs, even if parts of the job don't need as much. Um, and also, even when things are running smoothly, uh, there are runtime drawbacks uh, of this monolithic job, like state tied state checkpointing. Um, so while new features like unaligned checkpointing um, may help with this, um, trying to checkpoint this entire job and save the state all at once uh, might be slow and could lead to back pressure um, for this job. One of the ways that uh, I've heard um, things like that being talked about um, is thinking of the job state akin to a database and each operation state akin to a table. So in this uh, example, it's like a single database being shared by many different applications with many different goals. And we can kind of apply the same uh, sorts of um, techniques to break that apart. So we understand that we have a, a limited um, scope of uh, separation of concerns with this approach. But how would we start breaking apart um, a monolithic jo Flink job like this? Message queues. <laughs> so these systems create the stream primitive that we need to separate and link these jobs. But for this example use case, we really just need something that uh, we can send arbitrary messages from one place and read them from another. There are many, many options out there for message queues. Um, even within ASF, there are at least four that I could find. And they've all got their pros and cons and target different use cases, um, sometimes making it a bit difficult to understand what you really need. Do we need tiered storage, uh, the ability to replay messages, um, another stream processing platform? And all of these features are uh, great, but they come at a cost. And the main cost that we found is the difficulty in managing these more robust systems like Kafka and Pulsar. Traditionally, uh, Kafka, Pulsar, and Co. rely on a few external systems like Apache Zookeeper, uh, sometimes Bookkeeper, to support their advanced features, but making them a little bit trickier to deploy and manage yourself. And there are managed services out there, like AWS has the managed Kafka now, um, but they, they can fall into the same downsides as other managed services. And personally, we found these uh, advanced, advanced features intriguing, um, but we don't necessarily need everything that these things can bring, especially when you're just starting up um, and trying to rush out features. Uh, RabbitMQ, on the other hand, um, is extremely stable. It has a small core feature set that does one thing and one thing well. Pass messages around with a standard protocol. So the AMQP protocol used by RabbitMQ is uh, widely supported. It's implemented in a variety of languages, so finding uh, a client for your language is really easy. Um, deploying and managing a RabbitMQ cluster is also extremely simple, uh, since it doesn't have any external system dependencies. Uh, and for Kubernetes in particular, there's some really great community-supported uh, deployment methods out there, like uh, Helm charts. Uh, at FinTech Studios, we've also um, just manage these on EC2 instances uh, with very little maintenance. Um, yeah, the, the, it's there have been headaches, of course, like everything. But uh, yeah, on the on the whole, very little maintenance, uh, even for the most rudimentary deployment you can think of. Um, but really, this all boils down to stability and simplicity. 
Uh, both are extremely important when you're just starting to build your team, which is why RabbitMQ was a great fit for us. Is it our long ser- long-term solution? No, um, we're currently looking to move to Pulsar for all those fancier features um, now that we have the bandwidth to support it, but RabbitMQ has been extremely stable um, for us thus far. So looking back at this example flink job, uh, we can now chunk this out uh, along the logical boundaries and chain them together using uh, RabbitMQ. Uh, flink offers both sources and syncs for RabbitMQ out of the box, making it extremely easy to set up this kind of chaining. Uh, so now these jobs kind of can um, have their own logical sections. We can deploy them separately, uh, scale them separately, and alerting issues don't interfere with analytics. And most importantly, um, timely relevant data is still being sent to our, uh, our users. Everybody's happy. So wrapping up, um, to bring a little bit more concrete context, uh, when we first started out with uh, Flink and Kubernetes, it took our team a little bit more than a month to set up uh, Kubernetes clusters on EKS. And we've similarly spent a bit more than a month developing each Flink job after that. We currently have around six Flink jobs um, that process around 4 million events a day. And all our streaming jobs are currently connected with RabbitMQ, though hopefully Pulsar in the near future. But so that's that's really it for this talk. Um, thank you for joining. Um, hope you've had a great uh, Flink forward. Uh, please reach out if you have any questions or want to chat. Um, and finally, I really like to say thank you to the Viverica team for putting this together. Uh, and giving me the opportunity opportunity to speak here, um, I, I know a lot of work goes into it, and they're really they're really great people, and I'm sure they'd love to help uh, you get more involved as well if you'd like to. So if there's any time left, I'd like to open it up to Q and A. <clears throat> but once again, just thanks for being here, and hope you're staying safe. Bye.